pretty awesome morning so far, amen? amen. Got to hear the kids sing, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings, wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, to wait. You know, when we wait on God, we can have strength. Right. Then they sing, happiness is the Lord. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart today, you have every single reason to be happy. That's right. We sing dwelling in funeral land. We're going to go to heaven. We sang the old account was settled. Because the old account was settled, Christ saved us. We need to go to heaven right now. It's to look forward to. And all of this is to God be the glory. You know, it can be well in our souls. Whether it's peaceful, whether it's crazy, Satan's is working, our sins are gone. You know what? One day God's going to call us home. Amen. We get to have a good day. Each of these reasons are reasons we get to have a warm heart. You know, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul is sitting in prison, okay? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, Paul writes all of these letters to churches, to his friend Philemon, each of these things, but Paul is sitting in prison, but he's writing Philippians from prison, and he is talking about joy. Joy is mentioned so many times in Philippians, and he's talking to the Philippian church about joy, keeping a warm heart. You know, we need to focus on keeping a warm heart, having joy in these last days, and Amen. Just didn't have you turn there, but for time's sake, we won't. Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end times. He says you're going to be persecuted. Men are going to deceive you. So many things are going to go on. Nations are going to rise against the nation. There will be wars and rumors of war. Each of these things are going to happen. And in verse 12 of Matthew 24, he says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of men shall wax cold. It's going to get cold. There's going to be so much sin and evil. People's hearts are going to get cold in these last days. Right. But we as Christians... Do not need to let that happen in our lives. Philippians Amen. chapter 1. If you're there, um, you're probably beating me because I'm not there yet. I forgot to mark that one. Philippians chapter 1, though, Paul is writing from prison to the church of Philippi, and he is telling them how to be joyful in Christ. He starts off in verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you in joy, or always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both of my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may be approved, but approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. That's the glory and praise of God. He's sitting in prison. He talks about thanking God. He talks about joy. He talks about the glory and praise of God. He misses his brethren. He loves them. But Paul doesn't sound like he's bummed about being in jail. I'm sure he's not necessarily hyped to be there. But Paul is writing these things about being joyful while he's in prison. He had a warm heart even in prison. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we come in your presence this morning, Lord. Thank you so much just for the wonderful music this morning all around the kids, mom, Amen. congregation, everything going well this morning. Thank you. For those that had surgery this week, doing better, some have appointments coming up this week, Lord. I pray you continue to help them, Lord. Amen. Lord, just please work in us this service. Whatever goes on this week, help us to have a warm heart, keep our focus on you. Thank you that you're our God and we're spending eternity with you. Help them now to be your words, not ours. And if there's one not saved, I pray you save them today. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, so Philippians chapter 1, Paul is in prison. He's writing to this church in Philippi about joy. So how are we supposed to have joy? How are we supposed to keep a warm heart in these last days? Well, first off, Paul says in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You know, if we want to have a warm heart, we need to remember thankfully. Amen. Someone said in college, they said it quite often, they said you can't thank God without thinking. If you're not thankful, you're not thinking of all the promises you have. Right. Think about it. We get to come in this building. You know what? We have heat and air conditioning in this, morning, in this building. Yeah. Tim Brown came in this morning and he looked at me and he's like, Did you mean to turn the air conditioning on in the auditorium? And I was like, No, did I do that? So we had heat in all the hallways, but we had air conditioning in here. Isn't it a blessing to have both? Now, normally not at the same time, but sometimes 
stupid people like me. Turn it on, okay? But we have both. We have this blessing. We have power. We have live stream to where people that can't make it in can make it. Or they, they can watch it. And if you're at home and you could have made it, you should probably make it tonight, okay? Right. right. Yeah. We have each of these blessings. We get to go home. Many of us are going to have good food, whether God's eat. We have the fellowship of our family here. We have so many things to remember thankfully. Right. When we look back at our life, the song in his wealth, our soul, we can see God has been good to us. Looking back over our lives, we need to remember thankfully. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance to you. He's thanking his God. He's thanking the Savior. You know, we can be thankful not just because we're serving a God, some God, there's this God somewhere. No, we're serving our God. If you can accept yeah. Jesus Christ as your Savior, God is your God. He's my God. He's my yeah. Savior. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We can pray to God with thanksgiving. Right. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21 is talking about, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And in each of these things he's telling us, in verse 20, Paul says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can we be happy even if we're sitting in prison? For God's sake, if you're sitting in prison because you did something stupid, that's on you. Right. But if you're preaching the gospel, and Paul was preaching the gospel, and they took him in prison, he can still have joy because he's there because he was serving God. He says unto the Colossian church, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Paul was thankful he was thanking his God. When he was saved in Acts chapter 9, it says, And as he journeyed, he came near to he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about a light, he shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? God came to him and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul had accepted Christ as his Savior. God came to him. Paul obeyed God. He got saved. He said he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He was saved. Paul was thanking his Savior. He could remember his brethren, thankfully. And God was his Savior. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Yeah. He's remembering his Savior and his salvation. He's remembering the other saints. You know, when we have a hard time, we can think about saints of the past. You know, there's so many people in our lives of the past in our lives now that we can thank God for. We can look across the room, see people that have influenced us. Hopefully, we've influenced them for good. I mentioned it a couple times. I found Mike Sherbine's Bible. He used to sit right back there, I believe, behind Brother Stephen or right where Matthew's at, somewhere Mike used to sit. I've been thinking about Mike. I've been thinking about Al. I had something really encouraging last night. I was watching a video of my Uncle Michael preaching, and he said, we're going to look at this message real quickly because all I ever do is preach quickly. Now, that means I'm not the only one that ever stood here and couldn't ever take time. But thinking about these saints of the past, we can thank God for what they've done for us. Those of the past, we can thank God for the missionaries that have been through here, guys like John Moore and Larry Kerrigan. People that God has put in our lives, we can remember them thankfully. Yeah, and he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making requests with joy. He's going to remember thankfully, and then he's going to pray joyfully. You know, when we go pray to God, I remember one time we had the better day assembly at Burton Union, and they had a pastor pray, I don't remember who he was, and he got up and prayed, and he used the biggest words, it was the longest prayer I've ever heard in my life. He sounded sad, I was like, dude, just pray. It wasn't respectful. I shouldn't have been like that. But we have to pray joyfully. We don't have to go to this God that we're scared of and back off and hope he right. doesn't. We don't have to be scared. Hebrews 4 says, come into the throne of grace boldly. We can boldly go before God. And Paul says he's going to pray joyfully, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. If you want to have a warm heart no matter where you're at, remember the saints, remember the Savior thankfully, and pray to God joyfully. He says, always. First off, Paul is always going to pray. He's sitting in the jail. He's sitting in the prison cell. Probably doesn't have a lot to do. And he's praying. Even if they are working and whatever they're doing, Paul is always praying. He says, always in every prayer of mine for you. He's going to always pray. Amen. First Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. And then Jesus in Luke 18, 1, he starts to give this parable. But the point of this parable, it says, and he spake unto them, 
to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. How do we keep a warm heart? We keep praying, and when we pray, we're not going to faint. Jesus said that. We should be praying for others. He says in every prayer of mine for y'all, he's always going to pray, and he's always praying for others. You're going to notice as we go on with this message, keeping a warm heart basically gets back to talking about God and focusing on others. Okay? Amen. But he says, I'm going to always pray and pray for you all in every prayer of mine for y'all. He's praying for the Philippian church. We see as he writes the other epistles, he's writing to these churches. Paul is constantly praying for his Christian friends. He says in 2 Corinthians, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He's praying for them to have comfort. We can have comfort in God because God is the God of all comfort. Amen. He says we should pray for everyone. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. He says prayer, four different parts of prayer for others. We should always be Amen. praying for each other. Grab a prayer list. All right. If you're sitting at home, just think about how the auditorium looks, who sits where, which means you got to come and talk to people when you're here. But think about who all is here, who all you can pray for through the week. Pray for others constantly. But we can Amen. pray with joy. Amen. We know that God is the God of all comfort. He can bring comfort to the hurting. He can bring salvation to the sinner. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. We will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. We can have joy when we pray because we know God can bring comfort to those that are hurting. He can bring salvation to our unsaved family members. He can heal the sick. James says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He can bring rest to the weary. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. We have all these promises from God. He can bring us peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your, not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We can pray joyfully because we have so many promises from God that no matter what we're going through, we can pray always. We can pray for others. No matter what everyone else is going through this week, we can pray for them, uplift them in God, and see what God does. Praying joyfully will cause us to have a warm heart. He's going to remember thankfully. He's going to pray joyfully. And then he says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. In verse 5, he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, Paul's sitting in prison, but as he's praying for others, he's praying that they'll fellowship consistently. Now, Paul's in prison. He can't make it. Maybe today you're sick. You're in the hospital. You have health problems. You just seriously, honestly can't make it. That's okay. You're praying for us. We're praying for you. But if you as a Christian can't make it to church, we need to fellowship consistently. Every time the doors of the church are open, we as a family need to gather Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Right. God can use this fellowship in our lives. How? He gives us, gives us so many promises for when we fellowship with him. He says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the promise of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke into love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, not ditching church, not forgetting to come to church, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And so until Christ comes, we're supposed to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Right. We're supposed to keep remembering one another, praying for one another, and then we need to be in church. And he gives us several promises here. He says, for he is faithful that promise. We need to be faithful to church because our Heavenly Father is faithful to us. Amen. See, each of us that are saved, we have God living in our heart. We come together, God works in us, and we can share with one another what God has taught us throughout the week. We can bounce ideas off one another. You know, God showed me this in the Bible reading this week, and you know, I can say, man, that's a really good thought. I hadn't thought about that. And then I can look at it, and we can encourage one another. He says exhorting one another. We need to come to church to exhort, encourage one another. You know, when we come around other believers, we can be encouraged when we focus in on what God has done in their lives and the power in the assembly of God, we can have joy with one another. He also says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We're supposed to think about others to provoke, to get some action, to love and to good works. You know, if I don't come here all week, I'm probably going to be pretty dog on the You can ask my wife. If I sit at the house for the entire day, I'm going to be about the house. I'm not necessarily one that has to move around all the time, but we have a one-room apartment, and it's awesome, and I love it, but if I'm in the same four rooms all day, I'm going to go ballistic, okay? I need to at least get outside, walk, do something, just for even just 20 minutes, and I'm good. 
But Billy and I were talking about that earlier. Sitting down in the house all day is enough to kill us. <laughs> but we need to get to church throughout the week. He says we can provoke one another into love and to good works when we come to church. As Amen. you see the day approaching. So until Jesus comes back, we need to be in church fellowship consistently so that we can have joy. We can encourage one another. We can remind one another to help each other. You know, what we do for others in the week, we can come. Now, don't come and say, I did this this week. But like, hey, God gave me this opportunity to do this this week. He used me on the side. And you know what? God can use each and every one of us to do something for another. And we can remember that when we come and fellowship consistently. So when we're having a hard day, we're going through stuff. We take time to think about what God has done for us. Remember, thankfully. This morning in teens, I was like, hey, everybody on the back of your I do notes in the teen class, just fill in blank stuff. Helps me focus. But I was like, on the back of that, write five things you're thankful for. And they just sat and wrote five things we can share with one another. But I said, later this afternoon, thank God for those five things. Amen. You know, take time to remember thankfully what God's done for you. Paul says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. We can pray joyfully. You know, when we have prayer meeting tonight at 520, normally we don't go in there and be like, oh, this is the worst day ever. I guess we can talk to God. That's not how it works. No. We come in there normally. Some of us are bouncing off the walls and we share a prayer requests. Some of them are not fun prayer requests. But we can go to God knowing that he can do anything. He told us, right. let us have faith in God. That's what Jesus said. We need to have faith in God. Fellowship consistently. Remember thankfully. Pray joyfully. And then in verse 6, he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what is this saying? We can grow confidently. You know, now, in myself, I can't get any closer to God on my own. I believe, I didn't think class, Dad, I believe, taught my relationship with God this morning in Sunday school, focusing on growing close to God. But God has promised us that we can grow closer to Him. Right. If we get to close to Him, we can grow as Christians. We are to be confident in Christ. Mark eleven twenty two says, And Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. We are to be confident in Christ and we are to grow in Him. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, Paul says, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So when you have a muscle in your arm, okay, I am not ripped because I don't work out, okay? That's how it works. If you don't work out your muscles, they're not going to be ripped. They're not going to show. So God's not saying work out your own salvation, like figure out how to get saved. No, God saves us, and then when we work out our salvation, we can grow in him, and our Christianity will be more evident to others, and they'll want what we have as Christians. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Here in chapter 1, Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if God started a good work in us. He came to us and said, you need to be saved. When we accept Christ as our Savior, God's going to keep working that good work, perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 2, he says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He is going to put the desire in us to want to do well. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall grant thee the desires of thine heart. And Psalm 37 says, But when we get saved, God keeps working on us. He's going to put the right desires in our heart. Right. He works in us both to will and to do. He's going to motivate us to do right. And then he's going to enable us to do that. Amen. Paul says, you know what? We can grow confidently in Christ because God has promised us that he's going to keep working in us. So he says, I'm going to remember everything God's done for me. Remember, thankfully, remember you all. I'm going to pray for you all with joy. Remember, thankfully, pray joyfully. He says, fellowship consistently. And we can grow confidently. When we're doing each of these things, we're going to start growing. Amen. What's that song we used to sing as kids? Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. But if you don't read your Bible, forget to pray. You're going to shrink, shrink, shrink. We can grow right. confidently by spending time in God's Word and then spending time talking to Him, Him talking to us through His Word, us talking to Him through prayer. God can work on us, and we can grow confidently. Yeah. Like that song, it says, He is still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Think about this. It took Him just a week to make the moon and the stars. Right? Everything we've ever seen outside took God a week. Now, I've been saved 17 years. I have to do the math right. One time I did it. The papa called me the next day. He was out of town watching live stream. He says, so if you got saved when you were four and you've been saved 15 years, you're 19. But if I remember right, you're 22. I was like, you know, 
Okay. Anyways, I'm just saying 17 years. But God's still working on me, right? So it took him a week to make the entire universe. But God's been working on some of us 52, 50 or more years. Right. And he loves us more than the stars. That's pretty legit. I mean, yeah, the right. stars are ginormous. They got all this energy going for them. But God loves us more than every single star he ever created from us. Right. Because we can grow confidently in him because he loves us. So remember each other thankfully. Remember Christ thankfully. Pray joyfully. We need to have a warm heart. We need to fellowship consistently. God's going to help us to grow confidently. And then in verse 7, he says, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. He was thinking selflessly. So he says, even as it, is, as it is meet for me to think this of you all. So he's thinking about the people of Philippi. He says, because I have you in my heart. He's thinking about this church he started in Philippi, thinking about the people there. They're in his heart. He says, I'm thinking about you and as much as both in my bonds. He's sitting in prison. You know, whatever rewards he gets in heaven for having the bonds in Christ, we see in chapter 4, the Philippian church supported him as a missionary. Whatever rewards Paul gets for being in prison, in heaven, the church of Philippi gets it. He says, I'm remembering, I'm thinking selflessly in my bonds. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, when he's out preaching, he's defending the gospel, whatever God called him to do, whatever rewards he gets, this Philippian church is going to get. He says, right. ye are all partakers of my grace. He is thinking selflessly. He's not saying you're thinking, oh, woe is me, I'm stuck in jail, and all those people at Philippi, they're having a good time in church, doing whatever they want to do, and I'm stuck here in prison. No, Paul's like, Look, I might get some rewards for this, and God is going to use it to help me think selflessly. He's like, I'm thinking selflessly. He's going to help you through this. There was one pastor, a lady saw him in the hallway before church, and she said, Pastor, I'm going to have a breakdown. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. I can't do it. I'm done. Life is stressful. What should I do? And he said, go and bake some cookies and take them to some deaf people in the church. He said, spend an hour with them, getting to know them through however you can. He says, tomorrow, bake a cake. Take that cake to some blind person. Spend a little while with that one. The next day, go down to the hospital with a dozen roses and go to each room in the hospital that has nobody visiting you. Give a rose to the patient in that room and have a prayer with them for the one that has no visitors. He says, every day of your life, go spend at least one hour, at least one hour, forgetting yourself and thinking of others. Now, maybe we can't do an hour every day. But she was having a breakdown because she was focusing on how bad her life was. Right. But you know what? She came back later. She came up to him. It was a big church. She saw him several months later. And he's like, how was that breakdown? She's like, oh, I was too busy to uh, have a breakdown. Yeah, if we focus on others, we're going to be too busy to have a breakdown. He's right. thinking selflessly. Just go do something nice for someone else. Just Literally, I mentioned it before, but when I was working at Lowe's in college, this lady passed by me, and I smiled. I probably had an ask on me. I said, how are you doing? I finally see my smile. But I was like, how are you doing today? And she goes, what? And I was like, how are you? And she goes, I'm sorry. I'm like, how are you today? Are you doing okay? She goes, you're just being nice. Wow. No one's ever nice anymore. That's sad. That's like horrible. Right. But you know what? We can think selflessly and encourage someone else. And when we start focusing on others, that's going to work. So we don't have time for a nervous breakdown. We can have a warm heart when we think about each other. Amen. Visiting shut-ins. I may go to shut-ins house. I may be there 30 seconds. I may be there an hour and a half when I go visit someone that can't make their church. But pretty much every time, no matter how bad of a mood I am before I go, I tend to be super happy after I leave them because just spending time with other people, talking about Christ, helps us have a better day. Just they, I always get more out of that than I do then. Then they do. I always get more out of the visit than probably they do. Nursing home ministry in Maslin, me, Hannah, and Olivia have so many laughs there. There was one lady, she had a bad memory. She looks at me and Olivia and goes, you better marry that girl. The next week we come, she looks at me points at Hannah and goes, I just know you married her. You guys are married, aren't you? And I'm like, no, that's my sister. We are not married. It's <laughs> not going to happen, okay? But when we focus on others, when we think selflessly, God can encourage us. And Paul says in verse 8, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. So Paul was longing to see this Philippian church. He had a desire, but he brought it before God. He says, God is my record. God knew what Paul wanted to because God had talked to Paul, or Paul had talked to God about it. We need to, when we have a longing, we need to long properly. When we're having, going through something in our life, 
and it's really discouraging, we're struggling, it's, we're depressed, we can still have desires, but long proper. We have to write long ones. He says, God is my record, showing us he brought it to God. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. When you have a longing, something you really want in your heart, bring it to God. Now, don't be like, God, I want a million dollars. Okay, we all want a million dollars, right? Yeah. But that's not a big focus in our life. But when we're going through something, we're discouraged. God I really likes to have some encouragement. They bring it to God. And then Paul had the right desires. He brought it to God. God is my desire. How greatly I long after you all. He had the right desires. He wanted to see the Philippian church, those people there, in the bowels of Jesus Christ. He had a Christ-like desire. So when we have desires, we have longings in our life. Remember to long properly. Don't go mope around, tell 400 people what you want. Just bring it to God. I mean, if you want to mention it to somebody, it's cool, whatever. But, like, we can bring it to God. We have Christ-like desires, and God says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall grant thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37, 4. Amen. But God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the vows of Jesus Christ. He longed properly. He had the right longings. So he says, look, I'm praying for you all always. I'm remembering thankfully, praying joyfully. He's, he couldn't, he was in prison, but he's praying for them to fellowship consistently. Growing confidently, he and us, we can both think selflessly, long properly. And as God begins to work in us, we can keep a warm heart. Right. And in these last three verses here, he says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So he says, love and judgment in the same sentence. Normally, we think those oppose each other. We say, judge not that you be not judged. Well, we can still judge. If someone's, like, if I walk out and Mark's punch is gone, I can judge that that's probably not right. But I shouldn't be like, I'm never talking to Mark again, right? But when there's sin in someone's lives, we still need to love them. We need to love biblically, okay? Right. He says, love in all knowledge and in all judgment. So when we spend time in our Bible, we're going to gain the knowledge of what God says to do, how he says to live. But he says, I want you that your love may abound yet more and more. Our love's going to grow and grow and grow in knowledge of the Bible and in all judgment. So Liv worked at Starbucks in college, and I mentioned this before too, but she was like, literally one day, I've been there three or four weeks, she wore a skirt every day in there, and they're like, so you're Baptist, right? And she's like, yeah. They're like, aren't Baptists supposed to hate us? Some of them were LGBTQ and whatever. But they're like, aren't you supposed to hate us? And there's like, no. Why would I hate you guys? Jesus loves me. So what is Paul saying here? Love biblically. Love every single person. Yeah, yeah. Take care of them, love them, encourage them. Now don't say I support what you're doing. Love biblically in all knowledge and in all judgment. We can judge that it's wrong. But we can't reach them if we don't tell them about Jesus. We can't reach them if we don't love them. If we just walk up and say, I hate you, here's a track, that track's not going much anyway. Right. We need to love biblically, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And when we love biblically, we'll begin to live excellently. Verse 10 says, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So approve those things that are excellent, things that are going to last for a long time. I remember Ed used to tell us in Sunday school, he said, here in America we make stuff that doesn't last long, but in Britain... In England and stuff, those buildings are made to last like thousands of years. That's when we start considering it old, because that stuff holds. We need to approve things in our life that are going to be excellent, last for all eternity. That's right. Right now, if there's something cool, it's not bad to necessarily have cool toys or whatever, but don't make your life based on that. Focus on Christ. Focus on eternity. Amen. He says, when we Amen. focus on eternity, approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, living in excellency, excellently. <laughs> We must approve eternal things, things that are going to last. And then he says that we may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. What did Jesus tell the woman at the well? He said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit, enjoy, be excited to serve God, and be sincere. And he says, and without offense, in spirit and in truth. Now, don't just worship God and say, I had this experience one day, and I think, and I think, well, no, look at what the Bible says. Amen. You know, we had a good old time. I don't know if you guys did. Well, I had a good time playing guitar. I hope you all had a good time singing. You all sounded good, okay? I was not singing. I was playing guitar. But this morning, those songs were all based on truth. It's eternal things that God gives us. We can enjoy it, but we're singing stuff from the Bible. That first song the kids sang is Isaiah 
4031, I think, Isaiah 4031, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We can sing in without offense and sincerely and without offense till the day of Christ. In spirit and in truth. We can enjoy what we're doing. Amen. We need to keep it. We can enjoy the truth of God's word. We can enjoy it sincerely and without offense. So when we love biblically, we're going to live excellently. And lastly, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, into the glory and praise of God. We need to fill righteousness. Whatever we put in our lives, make sure it's righteous. When we read the Bible, Amen. think about those things all day long. Excuse me. The Psalms mentioned like 400 times. He's meditating on God's word. When we read God's word, think about it. All through the Bible, we see meditating on it. Think about it. David says in Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight. My strength and my redeemer. He says, let what I think about be right. We need to fill righteousness. Amen. When we come to church, take notes if you can, and then just think about this thing as all week. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, how do we fill righteously, which are by Jesus Christ, and to the glory and praise of God. Think about eternity, live excellently, and then fill with things that glorify God and that are from Jesus. By Jesus Christ, and to the glory and praise of God. So no matter what we're going through this week, whether we're going to a cancer doctor, Someone's having surgery. We have a funeral tonight. People are going through stuff we may not know. But keep praying for one another. We can, if you're having a bad day and not focusing on God, remember thankfully. Think about what God said in the past, the friends he's given you. Remember thankfully. Pray joyfully. Come to church. Fellowship consistently. We have church services this morning, 9, 30, 10, 30, tonight, 6, Wednesday, 7. And I don't think we have any extra services throughout the week until March 31st. Marietta Bible College is coming. It's saying, be here March 31st. It's Friday. Amen. But fellowship consistently. We can grow confidently. Don't let Satan tell you, oh, you're never going to amount to anything. Don't, don't listen to Satan. God says he's going to perform that good work in you until Christ comes back. If you're saved, God's going to keep working in you. Amen. Just let it. Don't listen to Satan. Let God work in you. Grow confidently. Think selflessly. We need to, when we have desires, long properly. And then we need to love biblically so we can live excellently and fill righteously. Amen. So as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, this message was for the believer. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, as our heads are bowed, eyes are closed as we stand, Jesus Christ died for you. Why were we having a good time singing? Why were we preaching on joy this morning? Because Jesus Christ saved us. If you never accepted Christ as your Savior, come today and we can teach you how to be saved. And Christians, whatever's going on in your life, you can bring it to God and have a warm heart of joy. I listened to him and called us it out for this message. Mm -hmm.